Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session. It's October 18th, 2017. This time, could we please stand and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, I need a motion to approve the agenda. I move that we approve the agenda for October 18th. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Um, moving on to presentations, Mr. Belusky, would you like to introduce the presentations for us? Yes, thank you, Ms. George. I uh, would like to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Page, our Supervisor of Science, uh, Physical Education and Health. Uh, Mr. Page is going to be providing you with an update on our new elementary science curriculum. That is a new adoption for this year. Uh, if you remember the last time uh, the presentation, we talked about our goals and indicators that we've transitioned to the next generation science standard. So part of the new adoption is to align our curriculum and our instructional materials to the new standards. And I welcome Mr. Page and his expertise that will give you a, a 30,000 foot view of the new materials uh, that our elementary teachers are excited to have. Absolutely. Well, good morning, board. Good morning, executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Page. I am the supervisor of instruction for science. Um, today, uh, my main goal is going to uh, provide you all with an overview of the new science curriculum for K to 5, grades K to 5. Uh, we ended up, over the summer we purchased, we piloted it all last year, and over the summer we purchased the a HMH, which is uh, Hootland Mifflin Hardcore. Did it change? Oh, it went too far. All right. Uh, hardcore uh, Science Dimensions. and. Um, what we're really going to go over is the teacher and uh, student resources. So that's going to be really the main goal of the objective is go over those uh, and um, discuss how the teachers go through planning, what are the components, how does it align to the standards, and um, how are we utilizing this new platform to enhance our assessments opportunities for our students. So the first thing that I want to review is the uh, purposeful professional development that we, we uh, that this program offers. Uh, this was one of the th items that we really, really uh, enjoyed. Um, the first one is that they offer 75 different modules of instruction on the next generation science standards, on the cross-cutting concepts, which are the ideas that span across the multiple domains of science. It also offers uh, instruction on the science and engineering practices that the students utilize to learn the content. Uh, so this is a great resource and what I've been promoting it as, it's a great resource for our teachers, but also if the teachers have difficulty understanding maybe how system and system models, models work within a science classroom, they can actually show those professional development modules to their students. Um, and uh, it, so it's both great professional development from our teachers, but also for the students. The next one is uh, the tracing tool, and this is an outstanding tool in which the teachers can actually see where the standards fall in that vertically articulated uh, group of standards. So if they are looking at this particular standard in earth and space science, they can see that it occurs in second grade, fifth grade, sixth through eight, and then um, uh, nine through 12. And the big eye-opening uh, portion of this tracing tool is that the teachers are seeing that if I'm a second grade teacher and that standard occurs in second grade and it occurs in fifth grade, that they realize that their instruction is really important for when we take that fifth grade assessment, the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment, because both fifth grade teachers and second grade teachers are the only ones really responsible for that particular standard. So this has been a really great eye opener for the teachers to realize that I really need to make sure I hone in on this particular standard in that grade level. Um, so we're going to use that as a uh, tool going forward in our curriculum development over the summer to really kind of highlight those particular standards that we really need to focus on. The next item that I want to discuss is I've been uh, going to each, uh, the principals have 
nicely invited me to their schools. Um, we gave a three hour professional development to each grade level in the beginning of school and we thought that they needed to have a little bit more um, as they've explored the, the platform, have me come in and kind of work with the teachers. So I've met with every grade level at every school, uh, K to five at this point. And again, those eye-opening uh, tools like the tracing tools, bringing that to the teachers, showing them what that is, um, has been really helpful. Going through how to do the single sign on, finding all the different components. Um, it's just like any new tool that you get there's that time of where is this, what is that, how does this work, and that's kind of the uh, where we are right now. And there are some teachers who have uh, really done an outstanding job and they're really enjoying it with their students. The next piece is kind of that the planning resources. Um, so I can see that. Uh, so the next part is that we have this particular content is aligned to our adopted state standards, which is the next generation science standards. It really emphasizes the science and engineering practices. Every grade level has an engineering component uh, to it. So uh, students are doing engineering in their own unit, but actually throughout each unit, there is an engineer it where the students have to engineer something within that particular content. So if it's life science, they're engineering something in life science. Um, the next one is the disciplinary core ideas. It has the content, which is that. Uh, and then it has the cross-cutting concepts, the cross-cutting concepts that I mentioned before, the concepts that are explored throughout. Strong curricular, um, cross-curricular connection. There are components in here and uh, that, that emphasize math instruction. So they have the math standards along with the, with the um, with the science standards, and then we have our level readers, and there are a lot of opportunities for students to be reading and writing within this platform where they're discussing their ideas, um, putting them on paper, and then reevaluating what their ideas are, and, and um, we use the, the platform claim evidence reasoning for that. Uh, the next one is it offers differentiated uh, strategies. It allows us to extend. It also allows us a little bit of extra support. I've worked with teachers in this particular world where the teachers are saying, well, my student got through this particular topic very quickly. What can I do to enhance their education? And that's where this program has those opportunities. Uh, an example that I worked with a teacher was they had to research an ecosystem. And what they were going to do is instead of having the students work on an ecosystem that was more familiar to them to enhance it or extend it for that child, they made them look at a past ecosystem, maybe where uh, dinosaurs had lived uh, um, and, and so on. So they had to really go in and look at something that they hadn't necessarily seen before, but they had to find evidence about that ecosystem and so on. And then a way to uh, offer supports to our students who needed extra support or hey, what are the, what's the ecosystem that we live in here? Let's look at those because those things are more familiar to those students and they could work on that. So there are some great ideas within there. And then also the Yale, Yale strategies, I've been working with Mrs. Walbert in terms of this uh, and she helped me evaluate this particular portion where they're highlighting words uh, when we have vocabulary, there's always an image associated with that vocabulary. So if the student doesn't necessarily know what that word means or maybe they mean, know what it means in their language, that image uh, allows them some context so that they can learn the words. That's just one example of how we're able to help those students, uh, our EL students. Uh, the next one is that all of their, um, all of their ass uh, assessments are aligned to the next generation science standards. And one of the great features of this program is that all throughout they integrate technology enhanced items. And what I mean by technology enhanced items are the dragging and the dropping of content into specific categories, or if there's a hot spot, uh, and I'm going to highlight some of these things later on, but that is exactly what our students are going to have to do on the high stakes tests like the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment. And the sooner that we get that in front of the kids and they learn how to manipulate and, and change, I think a lot of that is a learning curve when they get in front of that test, is that if they haven't seen those things or those items before, going into the test they're going to be uh, automatically intimidated. So this platform has a lot of those features to allow students to do a lot of that manipulation that we want them to do on the state test and simulations. If we get into the instructional piece of this, um, uh, the first thing that I want to uh, thank is 
Uh, Mr. Combs and I have worked to make this a single sign-on platform, and he's actually done a lot of, I have to say, he's done a lot of work in order to make things easier for our teachers to get onto our platforms. What I mean by single sign-on is that we all have Google accounts assigned to us, so once we're logged into Google, we can automatically click on a link and we get in. We don't have to remember passwords, we don't have to do any of that. Um, so it's, it's been really helpful uh, that Mr. Combs has been able to do that for us, and it's, it's really simple for the teachers. Once they're logged in, which normally they're always logged into their email, they just click a button, boom, and the whole platform appears, which is it's, it's very, uh, um, it, it saves a lot of time when we're trying to remember. And it's the same thing for our students, too. So our students, when they're logged into their Chromebooks, they're automatically logged in. All they do is they click the bookmark that's already provided. Mr. Combs put that bookmark on their browser, so they just click on it, they're automatically in and, and we can go. Uh, so it's, it's very, very helpful and he's done a wonderful job with that. Uh, there are really two components to this. There is, um, there is the hard copy material, so I brought an example. Uh, this is the teacher's uh, edition and then this is the interactive uh, textbook for the students. It's not a textbook that you and I, I are used to where you save it over time. <laughs> and uh, it, you know, we keep it for 10 years. This is a consumable textbook, so we're trying to teach the, the students that they can write, you know, just like we do in college. You, know, you write all over your textbook and you put notes in there. That's what the students are doing now, and they do a lot of the information. This is a kindergarten example. But they put a lot of their information right into here, and um, uh, it's very interactive for them, and that's a consumable that we've purchased for the next six years. So every year, a student would get that consumable in their classroom. Um, and then there is the online portion of the book. So all of this material is online, but it actually has you know, the simulations. It has a lot of that, those online features that I was discussing earlier. Student-led activities and investigations, our main thing going forward in, in, in the science world is we are explaining con are exploring content, excuse me, exploring content before we are explaining. So the, the drive is let the students try to figure these things out and then let us kind of facilitate their learning and guide their learning towards the concepts that we're trying to hit. Um, so hands-on and inquiry-based uh, learning, unit projects. Unit projects occur at the very beginning of each, of each unit where they explore again before they explain. Technology enhanced simulations. Again, going back to the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment, the last component of each item set is a simulation where the students actually have to interact with the interface and have data populated and then they're going to have to then utilize the data that they populated in the simulation to answer a series of questions. That's where this platform really does a great job because they do that in multiple different avenues. So it's not just the tests that are, that are uh, technology enhanced, it's also the simulations within the platform that are technology enhanced. So it's, it's very useful. Um, multiple representations of content, like I was discussing earlier. If it's a vocabulary word, we're showing images to kind of complement that. And then the last thing is that uh, the way that all of the, um, all of the uh, vendors that we looked at, everything is going towards a kit-based solutions so that teachers have the resources available to them and it's provided for them. So the, just like my biology, material, it is a kit-based solution for, for instruction. Um, a lot of the times we had teachers trying to purchase this and purchase that, that cuts a lot of that out and says these are the things that, that uh, teachers should be utilizing. So um, this is a kit-based uh, um, um, curriculum. The next, the next item is I do want to highlight some of the assessments. Uh, this, this is, these are two uh, particular items that I pulled from, from the platform. The first one is a simple dragging and dropping. So what they would do is they take those images and they drag and drop them into the categories. Exactly what they would do on the MISA assessment. This next feature is, again, it's simply linking to, uh, it looks like uh, they're comparing uh, features of different animals. So they would say which, which one is most similar to, to the other. Um, and so what they would do is they click 
on one and they click to the other to connect it and then it, it, it automatically assesses them. One of the great features is that students can do this within the classroom or they can do that at home. And so when they do it in the classroom, the teacher can actually pull up this individual student's answers. So if I wanted to check on little Michael's answer on this particular an uh, question, I can go click on my class, click on little Michael, and, and pull his information up and say, okay, uh, you got it or you didn't get it. So it's, it's, it's real time with them. Uh, the, net, the last one that I want to highlight is the project-based assessments. Uh, so this is kind of a supplement to our uh, unit assessments. So what the students can do uh, and the teachers can do is they can offer this or they can have the student, they can do it multiple ways actually. They can have the multiple choice interactive type assessment that we're commonly used to. And then here what they have is project-based assessments. The students would actually be creating a project and then we have created rubrics in order to, uh, to, to match those projects. And we, so it's kind of based on that one, two, three, and four that we're utilizing on our report cards. So to conclude, uh, you know, we are providing our teachers with the tools and resources uh, to deliver aligned and rigorous content. Um, we are um, continuing to enhance this, and I can tell you I, I, I was up here a couple weeks ago and I told you how hard our teachers really worked in my update. They are working really hard to, to do this, and actually you can see some of my edits in here, so as I go around and the teachers say, I thought this was better to be done this way, we're making those notes, and my curriculum team are making those notes so that when we come back in the summer, we have those notes available and we're able to, to, um, to just quickly get those things updated and pushed out to our teachers so that they can, they can do their jobs effectively. And then, uh, again, we're gonna be doing the school-based um, uh, professional development. Principals have already been taking some of my, so I've been into teacher specialist meetings. Um, the teacher specialists have actually taken that, that professional development that I provided to them back to their schools in this past elementary uh, PD day. Uh, multiple principals had had this as one of the uh, items. They actually used the professional development video modules for the teachers. They utilized um, some of the other resources that I had had provided for them. Um, so it's it's supporting right now. My main goal is really supporting the teachers and making sure that they feel comfortable with the platform and delivering all the material to them. Um, and then. You know, my name is Michael Page, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I would love to share more of this, and I told Mr. Paluski, I said, can I have the whole day to talk about this? Mm -hmm. He said, no, you got 10 minutes. <laughs> so I could, I could stand up here and show you a lot of the, a lot of the features. It's an outstanding platform for our teachers, um, but I'd like to open it up to any questions if you have some. Just one thing, the, um, for, Fifth grade, for second grade, you, they all have the teacher teaches the science. And I think in fifth grade, the same teacher that teaches math. There, it's fifth grade. I think they moved to separate science, not a separate science teacher, but I think my uh, son I would say a more, more specialized. They're specialized in a content. Right. That's correct. Departmentalized. So it, what I like about this is, I see areas where it overlaps. And like you said, math. You specifically said math, but I'm even. Even the use of the computer helps them in all these other subjects they work on. And, you know, the click and drag and all that is going to be useful. The other thing is if you have writing combined in here, too. So, I mean, there's so many areas that it helps the overall student, not just in science. The science is great, too. But I, I like that part. And then is some of this going to be carried into the middle school, you know, the concepts, the resources? Right. So... So yes, the content definitely is vertically articulated into the, the middle schools and high schools. Right now, currently, we're assessing our middle school content, or, or our resource, I would say. Um, and one of them is looking at the middle school modules f for this. Right. So that, and Captain Kelly, I'll just add to that, that what we're working on in curriculum instruction right now is our, our capital needs as it relates to um, <coughs> textbooks or tech books. So one of the next areas of need will be middle school science. So we'll be bringing that to you as a recommendation um, 
and I believe because of that alignment piece towards the standards, it, it definitely has to be a priority for us from curriculum instruction. So you will, just to make that connection when we start talking about capital needs on the, on the textbook side, that you'll see this come up to meet the needs of middle schools. Yeah, I would, ex I would expect that. If, if you're that happy with this and you think it's <coughs> working um, and we're going to be kind of analyzing that toward the end of the year or, or you analyze it all along to see how the students are doing, if you find it's yeah. working, then that would be a great justification for us to move on, move on to the middle school with mm -hmm. the whole concept. I think sometimes I have a, we get beat on because we try so many different things and, you know, we need... I think somewhere we need to be consistent, and I'm not sure where we do that. And since the standards are relatively new, we should be working with that and, direction. And, and the thing I want to add to that, and I think Michael's done an outstanding job. I was with him, and we rolled it out to the elementary teachers, and he has made them feel at ease that this is a year of exploration. Okay. Uh, if you use the analogy of going to a different supermarket, like you know where the milk, it's here somewhere, but I just got to find it. And I think that's a good analogy to say it's new resources. They just got to kind of find out where the information is. And um, as Michael mentioned, and I think this is really critical about listening to the needs of teachers, as he was mentioning. He's out there listening to them and, okay, we need to make some adjustments. So as he's working with his teams, I, and I think that's critical, and he's built a great relationship with his teachers. So um, that feedback helps. My understanding was there was quite a bit of anxiety, especially in the elementary level schools and the teachers, that this was going to be overwhelming for them. So by including them in the process. Absolutely. That's half the battle. I mean, yeah, they're and, best and, and to offer suggestions sure. for change. And, and I think the other thing that we need to be mindful of, obviously the, the implementation of science standards, we're mandated to do that. But I think what we're thinking about is being mindful of how much change that we're asking elementary teachers to do. Because let's not forget a couple years ago, we implemented a new elementary reading series. We implemented a new progress report series. So now they've got science. Uh, and just to put a little caveat, actually elementary math is going to be up for its adoption. So we're thinking we should maybe hold off for a year so it allows those teachers to kind of take a breath and, and not implement so much change at, at, at one time. So we're very mindful of the teacher and, and really how much that they're, you know, they're, they're working so hard and trying to do exactly what we're asking them to do. But right. you physically can only do so much and only handle so much Especially yeah. in the elementary world, because they are I mean, because the science they teacher, teach, the math teacher. They teach that, multiple subjects, right, uh, yeah. exactly. So that, I think that will be something in the future that we're going to be making a recommendation just to hold off for a year. But. I have a question. Um, does the consumable follow the program? Like they can flip the page and what's on the consumable is on the monitor? My question is, is if so like... So does, does this... Yes. Yes. Okay, so, so like if, if, the oh, inter if the internet goes down, Wi-Fi is down, um, and then the teacher spends, that's good to know, because then the teacher can refer to the consumable mm -hmm. for that lesson that day. Now, they've missed that lesson online, so do they have to go back the next day and do it again online? Because I, I'm assuming it would affect the end progress if it wasn't all done on the computer. So if you're following their progress and you have a day or two, say we have a bad snowstorm or a hurricane, so, something that the internet is down for a couple days and the kids have to do everything on the consumable, is that going to affect the end result if they don't go back and redo the, those online? No, they, they, they can be separate. I mean, so they don't have to do everything specifically online. Okay. Is that, is that kind of... Yeah, really I was just... Because you had said, like, the, so then the teacher can look at the student's progress throughout the year. At the end of the year, he's going to see, okay, we've been doing this program online. So everything that they do online, they can do in here. And so okay. the teacher can utilize both of those resources. But won't that affect the end data of what's online, the end product, if, like, one or two lessons aren't... They've skipped them... Put in, so put if they've online? answered, so what you're saying is that most of the questions and uh, items that they answer within the book, tech book, mm -hmm. they are not specifically graded and then reflect on their 
and within understand. the platform. They're not graded necessarily within the platform. Okay. They are just maybe like a formative look around, kind of check in, in all okay. this type of thing. So those in platform, like in textbook on the, on the ebook, those aren't necessarily graded towards the end of the grade. Okay. Through that platform. Is that what? Yeah. It's not, it's not. Actually, it's a very good question. Or if, uh -huh. if one of As those assessments aren't available sure. online that day and they have to do it on the consumable, will they have to go back then and then redo it all on the computer? So get the results. Yeah. To get the results. And, and I think it's a really good question. Unlike maybe an intervention that is completely uh, web based, where everything you have to do is web, and if you miss it that day where there's no consumable, that, and I can see your point to that, mm -hmm. that is not what, what, um, what, what's in with this program. It's, it's certainly be able to manipulate that, but if, a, if, whether it's consumable or whether it's online, there's no, if the child does it consumable or the child does it online, has no impact to their final grade. Yeah, we can, they can both be utilized for their final grade. That's what my question was. Are they both utilized? Yes. And so we have data minus two days because we had this issue and we have consumable data that's different obviously the chain the difference is those two days how do we meld them together and get them equal because really their progress is the same usually online as in their text right and if the teacher is using um, both as an assessment for their progress we're gonna have a differential when the online wasn't available. So, so it, they, can be, they can be used in tandem. They can go together. It, they don't have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. They're not dependent. Uh, right, they're not dependent on each other. But but so that, that's at the, the discretion of the teacher. Right. They can do this whole program online, or they can do this whole program on here, okay. or they can do both. And it, we're not getting together. a report that the teacher right. is going by from the data in the online process. Right. It's a combination of. Yes. Okay. It's really blended. Very good. It's really blended. Very good. So like when, when I discuss, so let's just get into assessments. When I discuss assessments with my teachers, there's really, in the elementary level, there are three ways that the teachers can really do an assessment. They can do a full online assessment. They can do a combination of both. Let's say we have students in the lower grade levels who um, need items read to them. The teacher can project that online that. portion of it and have that and go through the assessment with the students and have that in front of them. Gotcha. Or we can print out the assessment and have the students do the printout, just the printout. So there are a lot, that, that's another great feature is that they can do multiple ways of assessing with students. That's gotcha. all I was And yeah. the, that, the next way is they can push out the assessment completely electronically. So there are- At the teacher's discretion. It's at the teacher's discretion and, yeah, to, to gotcha. kind of so it provides more flexibility to the right. teacher. Yep. yep. We give uh, Chromebooks to every second grader? No. They go home grades three through twelve. Right. So we're usually the, not a second grade. Right. Teacher. So okay. so was, we're not like, we're not able to, to I know currently we about it, but. we're not able to send to uh, send out that information to our students. But what the teacher could do if they wanted to have a student. Uh, go through that, they could ha be signed on and have the student go through that individual portion of the assessment on their computer and then they could check it. Okay. okay. Yes. Question. Great. Any other questions? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. John. Thank you, Mr. Page. Welcome. Okay. okay. Um, Actually, before I, I, I introduce uh, our next item, uh, I would like to say that um, I'm honored today to act on behalf of uh, Superintendent Kane. I just want the public to know uh, while she is not here, uh, she as well as Mr. Pender and um, Ms. Poland are presenting to the governor uh, around the capital needs for the school system. So I'm happy to certainly be in her absence today, but I want the public to let them know. Uh, while she is not here. The next item that we have is 3.02. Uh, this is going to be an update uh, from Mr. Engel, our supervisor of student support services and many other things, uh, just to give you a, a current update uh, on our enrollment uh, projections <coughs> for this year. Welcome, Mr. Engel. 
Hello, Thank Mr. you. Hill. Good morning to our esteemed board members. Happy to be here. Uh, for the record, my name is Brad Engel, and I am the supervisor of student support services for the Queen Anne's County School System, and I'm proud to be here. So, uh, student enrollment is it up? Uh, do I do that? <coughs> and I believe that the uh, the remote there is Brad to your right. Remote. <clears throat> student enrollment. Uh, so we're going to do an overview of the enrollment data, and uh, if you have any questions about anything that's presented, um, be happy to share that um, and to you know gain an understanding uh, about our, our enrollment trends over the past year and the past few years. Um, and I did this last year, so I guess we'll go right to the uh, first slide. It's kind of difficult to see, I apologize. Um, but we have a breakdown of the uh, number of students um, by school and by grade. Um, and you'll see in a couple slides that we have had an increase in enrollment this year. Uh, we have, for the most part, been pretty steady over the past 10 years as far as enrollment. Um, haven't had, I guess I'll go to the next slide. Oh, no. All right. Okay, so this is the uh, enrollment uh, for the past 10 years, as you can see. I'm sorry, this is a little awkward for me. This is our September 30th numbers? Yeah, the September, yes. Every year uh, we get our enrollment for September 30th, and that's the Budget. final date. That's kind of the cutoff date for, yeah. So we call it our fall enrollment. And even though this chart looks like it's a little up and down, um, you know, the numbers are pretty pretty even across the board. Um, and so you can see the trend over the past few years, we have had an increase where the numbers had gone down from 2009 uh, to, a, and to, to 2014, and then it picked up a little bit. Although the numbers aren't, it's not a huge increase, but it's enough to, to note that we are, over the last few years, have seen an increase in our enrollment. Um, and so that's always brings in more money for the school system and you know we're getting and the kids are great kids we're, that are coming in um, from different parts of Maryland across the country so we're always excited about that uh, and okay. and again this is another uh, snapshot of the enrollment numbers you know by school over the past three years and where you can see Again, some increases and de decreases. Like I said, nothing, nothing dramatic um, that I had that I had noticed. Um, although you know, you'll notice an increase in Stevensville has gone up probably by 10 percent. But because it's because of the size of the school, it's it's absorbed pretty well. Um, so. What? What? Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Got. Trying to read your chart, understand your little chart here. Maybe I'm just not looking right. Um, this this one that's up currently up. the last one. Yeah, the, the one prior. This one here. 2016 and yeah. Okay, mine's wrong over here. Okay. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. Okay. It just. What These I'm are thinking. just simply the student numbers. So mm -hmm. the first column is 2017-18. 20. Well, I hope Here's you have what a, I'm looking at on mine. You should have 15, 16, then 16, 17, and 17, 18. Okay. okay. And, and it, it may be, Captain Kelly, that you have to download it. it if, sometimes if you don't Those download the good. presentation, yeah. it might skew. All right. Got uh, it. That. Same. Okay. We're looking at three years. Yes. Okay. Correct. All right. And then if we look at our uh, diversity chart and look at our ethnicity, we're not, we're not a very diverse county, to be perfectly honest. Um, there's, there's, um, and, and that's reflected in our data. Um, so you can see that that breakdown. And our elementary school enrollment. And middle school. School. And then home instruction is an interesting uh, piece of our of what we do in student support services uh, because 
you see that we do have quite a number of students that are on home instruction. As a matter of fact, there are 280 students that are on home instruction, and some are monitored um, by parents. Some are monitored, monitored by an MSDE uh, program. They may use an online program that's approved by MSDE, so it's, it's an umbrella group. And if a student is 17, we generally aren't monitoring those students. And looking at some of those options for students, because we are looking at some online options, and it's just something that I know Mr. Paluski has, has certainly taken the lead on with, with Dr. Kane, looking at some online instruction possibilities, because we have a lot of, there are reasons why we have 280 students on home instruction. And there, there are many different reasons why. But possibly if there were some online options that we could make available to students, we could actually enroll them in our school system. So it's just certainly something to consider. Um, and, yeah. and Mr. Angle, just to jump in here for one second, sure. this is not to con this is homeschooling, not to confuse right. home and hospital. Yeah, that's right. right. These Correct. are this is home. So these are these are students that are not they're here in Queen Anne's, but they're not they're counted not as part, part of our enrollment. Right. 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 And and that's the discussion with Dr. <laughs> Kane that we've been number. having is how can we attract more of those students to our school system, maybe in a different environment. Do you have a breakdown of elementary, middle, and and high school for home instruction? Um, so, uh, let's see, I think that I have a grade, the next one is a grade by grade. I know there's about 110 middle and high school students out of that. So, I would say the majority of them are elementary, and there's kind of a, and the next slide is by grade. Um, but that's kind of the, that's, you know, the approximate numbers. Um, and certainly the high school students, you know, um, on home instruction, if they are able to enroll, would be able to participate in extracurricular activities. So, oh yeah, yeah. So that's certainly just something to think about. Yeah. Have those numbers changed drastically over the last five years? Uh, no. Okay. I mean, we've had a, it, we're slowly increasing. I think, mm -hmm. um, which would be understandable. But we haven't seen a big no. increase in any there hasn't particular been a, year. That's right. No, there hasn't been a dramatic change. Gotcha. Yeah, it's been. For the most part, pretty. But steady. still, 280 That's a lot students of kids. consistently is, yeah. a, is a lot of students. Yeah. And if we could just attract, imagine if we attract half. Yeah. How much more we could increase our funding? <laughs> right. Maybe. But, I mean, it's all relative. The funding per student is still really low, so we're attracting more students, and we're not adequately funding them, no matter what. Exactly. So it's a double-edged sword. Yep. Okay. Any questions about the enrollment data? Do, do you have stats on the kids that come out of middle, out of not, um, eighth grade, and then choose not to go to our high schools? I can get that for you. I'm wondering, it, it's yeah. not that important if it's a lot no, no. I can, I can, I can um, get that for you. We can, we can get it to you. That's a good question, because there, there, you know, that's a lot. That's a concern. You have a lot of students in eighth grade, and high school is a whole different, you know, ball game. Yeah. And it's always been that way. I'd like to see that trend too. Okay. What's happened in the last five years with eighth graders going off to a private school. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to get that information for everybody. Um, how many eighth grade students actually opt to go on uh, on home instruction? Or in private, high private. Or private Even school. private school. Okay. Aside from the home instruction, we kind of have that, mm -hmm. but they're still so how many in students the conventional we lose? education program, they're just on the private side. Sure. So we've lost that enrolled yeah. student. Yes. Um, and n nine out of ten times that does happen between eighth and ninth. But we even see it tenth grade. They've decided to go to private school for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah. I'd just like to see how that has transpired over five years. Okay. Be happy to provide that point. Okay. Any other questions? So I have another. I can move on to the other presentation. <coughs> Okay. Thank you. You're welcome to move on if you'd like. Okay, thank we, you. Is that okay with the board? Okay. To, fine, because we're, we're a little ahead of schedule, so I think that's fine. Great. All right. Mr. Angle, then we'll transition. This is our series. Uh, if you remember the last work session we had, we updated you on goal one, which is our academic uh, indicator. And Mr. Angle, was, he'll update us on uh, goal two, which is our safe schools indicator, and be able to share with you some of the progress that we've been making. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> this presentation is on safe schools, and so the purpose is to provide an overview of the uh, strategic plan goal two and uh, talk about some discipline data and discuss some prevention and intervention initiatives, both school-based and system-wide. 
again, to describe trends and patterns and gain an understanding of the related data <coughs> and how it impacts school climate. So these are the um, indicators for the safe schools. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, uh, uh, students avoiding committing a physical assault, of course, is very important. And also, we want our students to adhere to the policies regarding substance use, you know, tobacco, alcohol, et cetera, and also um, not suspending students or having students not, uh, you know, get themselves in a position where they are suspended out of school. So as we look at, you know, the first data, piece of data, this is the data from the last school year. These are the number of students that have been suspended. And so there may be, there may have been a student that has been suspended multiple times. We had a, a number of students, maybe a dozen that were suspended multiple times, some three or four times. Uh, but these are the actual number of students that actually received a suspension. And you'll see that the top two reasons for us is, first of all, our numbers are low. And then we, we feel good about that. You know, 156 is low. It's one of the lowest numbers in the state. We've had low numbers for quite a long time. But one thing that is a concern is the number of fights that we have in our school. We had, uh, you know, 33 fights that resulted in a suspension. So, you know, we're doing things to address that. We're, um, you know, we're working with, uh, we're trying to get some restorative circles going in our schools and working on mediations and prevent, to prevent these kinds of things. What I hear anecdotally about some of these incidents, and there's a lot of them are started on social media. So they actually start, you know, before the school day even begins. And actually, there'll be an alert. Well, and, and then the other thing, the other piece of this, and this may go along with sort of our bystander mentality, is you don't have students say, hey, that's not a good decision to ramp this up and get into this fight. It's what they should be saying. They're saying, come on, you mm -hmm. know, you know mm -hmm. they're, they're really encouraging these things. And so um, that doesn't help the situation at all. So uh, I think that, you know, talking about school climate, and I know we do that with, with our Albeas program and the Life Skills program, we talk about students making good decisions is so important. And we had, there's, in, in uh, psychology, you learn about groupthink, where a group is, is not making as wise a decision as an individual. Well, you get these groups together, and then poor decisions are made. So fighting is, is an issue for me, you know, and, and we don't want that in school. We, it makes our schools unsafe. It's an act of violence. It makes our schools uh, not as safe as they should be. We pride ourselves on having a safe school. Now, the other piece here is disrespect, and that's the other top reason for suspension. And so suspensions are uh, delivered at the discretion of the principal. So it, to me, disrespect is a discretionary offense. So we're working with schools to reduce suspensions for disrespect. Now, everybody has their own personal philosophy about what disrespect is and how, sh how it should be addressed. Um, I believe that when a student is dis disrespectful, it is a teaching moment and that you can address that disrespect and that you continue to address that, you know, um, and then obviously there's a consequence, but, you know, does that consequence have to result in a suspension? I think the Maryland State Department of Education guidelines say that suspension is supposed to be a last resort when there's nothing else that you can do with this child. With this child is such a disruption to the school that they need to be suspended. So that's, those are the, those are the guidelines and those are the things that we talk to our administrators about. Um, having said that, there are some other incidents and, in, in, uh, you know, reasons for suspension here. And I think this is an important slide. It kind of gives you a little snapshot of what our schools are, what, are, what is going on in our schools. And uh, so, you know, substance use is, is an issue. Last year we had a number of, of incidents. Um, and if you combine the drug and alcohol, it probably had 22 last year. Um, so we know that, that has, that's another problem that we have in our schools, so we're, we're, we're addressing that as well. So, um, so like I said, I think that's an important slide. Okay. Um, break we call down. it other, other weapons, what do you, you know, are there some, we just weapons, you mean? What do you consider a weapon? 
Well, it can be. A pencil. Yeah, it can. Yeah, that's right. what I'm wondering what yeah. you're calling. Personal it experience. Like yeah. A pencil across the cafeteria. So anything that's used as a weapon. Yes, yeah. that's right. The other thing I have a question on that 156. I know we say that's we're happy that's a low number. I mean, I'm not. I mean, I'm based on the 7,800 students we have, more valuable information would be percentage based on, say, other schools. If you're comparing us to other schools, we don't have very many kids in our schools. So. You mean other school systems as far as our right. percentage? Yeah. Oh, I mean, our, that's, a, that's less than, that's probably less than 2%. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I don't know what they have. I mean, how does that compare to other schools? We we could provide that to you. Do you want to just, just look at the schools? Eastern yeah. Shore? Just a few. It's only, and I'll get I've got it at my fingertips, and it's on the MSDE uh, website as well. Um, I can we'll tell you. We'll follow that. We'll follow that yeah. back up with you. Not to bash our neighboring counties, but there's some counties that have double-digit suspension rates. So, okay. you just know. Get a feel for. Sure, sure. I, I would say we are either one or two. You know, the one or two lowest. Usually, the only county that is lower than us is Montgomery County, percentage-wise, and they're huge. Yes, right. You know, so us, and it, we know when you have a small number, any suspension jumps that number up. So, um, but I, I'm happy to provide that for you as well. Okay. So. Just, yeah. as, as a matter of fact, uh, Captain Kelly, we'll provide that in our weekly update next week. That'd be great. Thank you got you. it. You got it, sure. So this is, um, we're looking at disproportionality and suspensions. Um, so you have the number of uh, students suspended in blue, and then you have um, African-American students, special ed students, white students, Hispanic students, and, and multiracial. And it gives you a breakdown of uh, students who are suspended in those categories. And I think, you know, one thing to note is we, we know that, that uh, we have a disproportionate number of suspensions. And I started talking about this with you guys back in 2014. And I presented information on disproportionality. We've been disproportionate for, uh, you know, every year, I know, for at least the past five years in those two categories. And um, so the number of special ed students that are suspended is higher than the population. And the number of African-American students is higher, probably by three to one, probably by three to one ratio. Um, so that's certainly something that the state is asking every school system to address. There's disproportionality in every school system across the state. Matter of fact, statewide, I think our numbers match locally what, what the state has. So, I mean, it doesn't make it, you know, doesn't get us off the hook because we need to do more. We need to do more with this. And uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to go about this. And a lot of it is, is, is you know, having served as a school administrator, um, you know, they're the ones that hand out the suspensions. Um, looking at, you know, why you're suspending students, taking a look at, you know, um, you know, what sort of precipitated the event and, and finding alternatives to suspension. What we do now is we've set up Anchor Points Academy as an alternative to suspension. So if a child is suspended, say for a fight, and the principal wants to have the child out of the building, we have that child go to Anchor Points Academy for those days and it doesn't count as a suspension and they're getting instruction and we feel it's more of a consequence than a five-day vacation so that's how that's how we feel we've been implementing that for the last few years so there are other consequences there's loss of privileges you know there's other things that, that we can do so taking a look at disproportionality and and you know it's it's males 90% of our suspensions are males how does that impact their extracurricular activities if they get suspended or just sent to anchor points, let's say, and not suspended? Is there a consequence to some of those activities that are so important to some of them? Certainly during the time of suspension. Now, that is a principal decision because the suspension itself is a principal decision. They can remove the child from, that can be another consequence, is, is that's a loss of privilege. Participating in extracurricular sports to me is a privilege, so you can lose that privilege. High school, I, I remember as an administrator, the worst thing you could do is take away a child's parking pass. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you know, that was very effective. That was a very effective deterrent. So, but also, you know, their participation in sports certainly should be considered. I think that's, that's a very important consideration. And are we researching to ensure that suspension reasoning is fair across the disparities. You know, are we seeing a higher incident 
of African American males being suspended. We are. Because their behavior is so much more egregious than, let's say, any other category, or are they not being treated exactly the same as the other groups? I mean, I'm not saying we're doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking how are we ensuring that treatment is fair and equitable to all? So if this one has this offense and this one has this offense, are we ensuring they both get the same? Yeah, we have a lot of work to do in that area. And we've done a lot of work in the past few years led by Mr. Paluski, where we've looked at, at cultural proficiency and understanding, you know, um, people who don't look like us. You know, and that's a very, it's been very important for me to learn as well on my journey to cultural proficiency, and it has not been easy. And I've learned a lot, and I thought, wow, I can't believe I ever thought the way I thought. But that's, those are, um, those are lessons that we continue, you know, to move forward with. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we meet with administrators and we talk because they're really at the point of contact, but the teachers too. Sure. The teachers too, because if a child feels like they're being treated unfairly, they have that sense, you know, and it may be coming from the classroom, and they may or may not be. Right. But if they have that feeling, it has to be addressed, and, if, and, it, and they can react. If you feel like you're being, being treated unfairly, you're going to react in a certain way. Sure. And, and parents want that, too. I think as a parent, we all sort of, we're, we have our helicopters out, you know, ready to go to the schools if we feel like our child's not being treated fairly. And that's very important to us. It's very important that our child, we, we get equity across the board. We, I would just say we have more work to do in that area. I think the principals have been, you know, responsive to this and the teachers have been responsive. And we need to keep perpetuating that, you know, if you have a child that doesn't look like you, that, you know, you have to learn how to, um, you know, Absolutely. relate to that child. Um, and sometimes if there's a discipline scenario where you're meeting with a student, making sure there's somebody in the room that looks like a child. So, and that's something we're, we're, you know, we're getting better at as well. So, you, you ask a lot of good questions, because I have the same questions myself, and, you know, I don't like to say, oh, everything is just wonderful, right. because we have a lot of work to do. Yep. Okay. And we also will be adding our, our two, and two, another piece of this is culturally responsive teaching strategies. Mm -hmm. Every child learns differently. And I think as Brad was mentioning, the awareness, we've got a lot of more of awareness doing and, and thinking about approaches to reach all students. Yeah. I think Robert, not to just the, co the color not looking like you're being, it, another one is just performance, you know, I mean, you can get a kid that's on National Honor Society and then makes a big, gets into a big fight with somebody and we treat them differently than we treat other kids. Do we kick them out of National Honor Society? I mean, the, I'm just saying we, we need to look at the whole picture, not, mm -hmm. you not know, just that, color. right, yeah. because that, gender. I've heard complaints about mm -hmm. that kind of thing, too. Gender. You mean like the good kid syndrome? Oh, he's a yeah. good kid. Right, right. So we're going to overlook so this uh, offense, either. but, oh, this is, this is, we know about this child. This child has been in yeah. an issue before, so Influences. we're going to, you know, right. yeah, yeah, you know, the good kid syndrome. And, and, oh, he's a good kid. And, and two that I knew, uh, Miss Pauls last year had worked with uh, Mr. Angle and our assistant principals on how we're um, implementing consequences depending upon what the infraction is and is there some consistent we have a lot of work to do in this area it is there's a lot of work there's been some great work started but we still have to matter of fact mr angle and i'll be working with the assistant principals on this very issue um, throughout the rest of the year yeah and especially going back to the fighting thing you know <coughs> fight just didn't come out of nowhere so there's a reason why, you know, two students are fighting. And, and people were probably aware of this way before. So it's, you know, kind of getting everybody, you know, on board with these kinds of things. So. Which leads like that, like the spec ed issue. If you've got kids in special ed yes. that, that are classed that way, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then you have kids that are high performers. Sometimes they're smart and they can get out of trouble. <laughs> They could, I mean, there's all kinds of things that lead to kids getting in trouble, I agree. Okay. So, and then, you know, things that we do, and you know, there's the prevention and intervention. 
you know, we have, every school has a school climate team and they meet on a weekly basis and they have uh, things like PBIS, which, you know, the, my big thing about PBIS is that, you know, it's, it's how teachers and staff talk to kids. And I believe that the model for PBIS is 80% of the conversation should be positive. And I'm, and I'm hearing that in some schools, but not in every school. So four out of five, you know, conversations with a student should be positive, and one out of five should be corrective in nature. And we try to avoid the negative, uh, you know, conversations. We, we've, we've heard them before, but I think that's very important, you know, having those conversations with students and, and making them feel valued and important. And we have so many teachers that do that. Building relationships is, is a strength of our school staff, without a, without a doubt. So a lot of our positive behavior initiatives and are, are important. Anti-bullying, um, you know, we we do a lot with that. Again, we need to do more. And uh, you know, culture proficiency, youth mental health first aid. I think I had mentioned that before. That's a training on how to uh, work with at-risk kids, maybe for drug use, suicide, and that kind of thing. And we're going to be doing another, another training. I would invite all of you to participate if you're available. Have some, sometime in December, we'll send that out. Uh, to everybody. Olveus, which is anti-bullying and life skills, drug prevention, and then anchor points uh, and alternative to suspension. So there's a lot of things that are, that are going on as far as preventing an intervention, but uh, again, we have our work cut out for us, for sure. So that was... So anyway, we are committed and, you know, we, we know we can't really get anything done academically and, uh, you know, with Mr. Pelusky, unless we have a safe school, unless we have an orderly school. And we do. We had visitors here yesterday, and, and uh, we, we took them around, and they were very impressed. And we all know we have very safe schools and very orderly schools, and we just want to, you know, continue to work at that and make our numbers look even better. Okay, question. And, uh, just one thing, Mr. Angle, you, do you want to let them know that uh, yesterday we, uh, as we promised even last year, talking about alternative education, but mm -hmm. they, we've started the audit around or the review rather of our alternative program. So that had started uh, yesterday and Mr. Angle is leading that with some outside consultants. So we'll be anxious once we get that information and within the next month that we'll come back and share that review with you yeah. of what we've learned. Right. And I just want to make sure we don't it, don't make it all financially driven. I mean, because I, I don't, more and more I think about a loss of that anchor points. I mean, I don't know the data that will come out of it, but I'm not sure that's a, a good idea. Well, what, what, uh, what really we're looking at is, and certainly is under Dr. Kane's vision, is uh, how do we look at alternative education differently? Not necessarily the, the dollar amount. We'll certainly look at that, but how, how do we look at uh, alternative education? How do we look at home school or uh, homeschooling, uh, home and hospital? Uh, a lot of those alternative pieces that fall under, as well as the fact that we have over, I think it's about 60, 65 students that have high anxiety. Uh, and what we're thinking about under kind of Brad's vision is how can we reach those students potentially in a different environment? In a, in a different platform. And we certainly want to, Superintendent's vision is about expanding our online uh, footprint and to be able to offer more. So that's another kind of caveat to that. Uh, we had met with a community college on Friday mm -hmm. uh, and, and Brad had, had connected uh, with some folks over there that are willing to help us to rethink about that. So I'd see the review or the audit is, is really a beginning point of rethinking about how can we, how can we reach more kids. Yeah, I would say easily two to three percent of our high school students have such serious anxiety um, disorders that it's, that it's difficult for them to come into the building, whether it's a generalized anxiety or if it's a more acute panic disorder. Um, that is up nationally. That. And that is we up have, nationally. We if have, they're not homeschooled because of it, they are having a very large unattendance rate well they're going on a home hospital mm -hmm. you know and they're written out mm -hmm. by a psychologist psychiatrist so we we provide them services that way they just can't come into the building some students we bring to anchor points because it is a smaller environment they're more comfortable there with the small you know group some are not so um, so that's a that's a large group and it's gr that's growing yeah that group is growing every year and and, and the that counselor's office yeah the counselor's office are flooded every day with with uh, students that can't make it you know but i'm wondering too the, because of the, the rigor of the curriculum i mean the, it's tough being a kid isn't it i mean it really is looking at it now the high school stuff i'm like oh my 
Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on these kids. I felt that pressure when. Yeah. Was... So, all right, anything else? Thank you for your nope. time. Appreciate it. Thank you very it. much. Right. Um, at this time, we can either stop and take a break for lunch or we can continue out the agenda. Um, we are ahead of schedule. I don't know how. how and we only have just, just two quick items, but it's certainly right. up to the board. I need to excuse myself to the right, rest. So, why don't we just go ahead and take our break then and, oh, okay. and we'll come back? Okay. That's fine. Thanks. Okay. okay. Yep. Thanks. Jeff. Welcome back. And at this time, we would like to continue with the agenda. Item 5.02, the review of Superintendent Goals. Mr. Poluski? Yes, on behalf of the superintendent, wanted uh, to make sure that we communicate to the public that she <laughs> has uh, submitted her uh, goals to the Board of Education that will be under review and consideration during closed session at the November 1st Board of Education meeting. Okay, and we'll be receiving those this week? Yes. Okay. Next on the agenda is the future meetings um, slash events. October 25th is Unity Day. October 27th, the Teacher of the Year Gala. And November 1st is our next monthly meeting. Um, anybody else have anything to add to that? Uh, not to any of those items, but uh, if it's okay with the Board of Education, I would like to uh, formally announce one of our uh, our newest members of our team, and that is uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Akita Stembar Pearson, who is our acting communication specialist. So she has been taking over. She will be taking over the role formerly that uh, Ms. Geneva Harrison. So uh, we welcome her, and she has a wealth of talent, and has been uh, such a breath of fresh air for for us as a school system. I know she's going to help us do great things. So welcome, Akita. Great, welcome. <clears throat> and at this time, if I could get a motion to adjourn the uh, work session, please. I just have a question. Oh, the, yeah. The goals that are on line here, that's the ones for the doc Dr. King, right? Correct. Oh, okay. I I'm sorry. I thought I was, I was asking for a paper. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, no. I believe there's one. Either she had sent those or yeah, those are in, at, at right now they're for board member only view. view. Sure. Sure. And um, I know she wanted to get them out to you so that you had an opportunity to review that, and then at closed session we can go in into a greater detail of edits, changes, that kind of thing. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I move that we close open, close our uh, work session. For I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments regarding the motion? Hearing none, I call for the adjournment of the meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.